Well, the Supreme Court was hearing arguments today in the Suomoto case on uh, COVID pandemic management. This is the case that, in fact, uh, the Supreme Court had taken upon itself. Uh, Supreme Court had decided to oversee uh, the broad policy maneuvers that are being, in fact, employed by the center as far as dealing with this uh, pandemic is concerned. And what's interesting is that Justice General Chu, who's heading the three-judge bench hearing this matter, uh, who incidentally very recently recovered from uh, COVID himself, uh, came out all done blazing today. Uh, today was, in fact, the first day that he reported to court after having recovered from COVID, and he did not have uh, very kind words to say with respect to COVID, pand uh, COVID pandemic management, uh, and made various observations aimed directly at the center. In fact, uh, we've shortlisted uh, 10 such key observations, which in fact indicate uh, what are the questions that center will be probed on, and what are the perhaps challenges that lie ahead uh, before the center, uh, as laid down by the Supreme Court. Let's take our viewers through them one by one. The first observation, and this is a very interesting comment coming in from Justice Chandrachur himself. Uh, the first key observation, and this should uh, give our viewers some indication of the tone and tenor that the Supreme Court has adopted now in dealing with the center. Uh, this is from Justice, uh, Justice Chandrachur, and I quote him here. Uh, he said that we saw a picture in a news report of dead body being thrown in the river. I don't know if it's a sedition case has been slapped on the newspaper carrying the photo. Uh, now, this is a direct dig aimed at the government, not just the center, but also states, states, and as well, various governments that have launched, in fact, sedition proceedings against uh, people who do not have kind words to say about the government on how the government is managing the pandemic, on how, in fact, uh, uh, citizens are airing their grievances. Uh, we've seen many such reports surface. In fact, the Supreme Court just a few days back uh, had, in fact, made stern observations that uh, no government should, in fact, uh, you know, initiate any proceedings and prosecution uh, against people who are airing their grievances, uh, especially in such times of pandemic. So this is a direct dig there. Uh, the, the sarcasm is very evident here. Uh, Justice Chandra observing that he's not sure if sedition cases, sedition proceedings have been launched against such uh, newspapers or publications. That was the first key observation. The second key observation, and well, this is, of course, uh, again, a direct comment coming uh, from Justice Chandra Chandrachur Chandra in uh, directly at the center here. Uh, he says, and I quote, that the ability to acknowledge that one is wrong is a sign of strength and not weakness. A very important point there, uh, Justice Chandrachur saying that, and let me explain the context here, Justice Chandrachur was actually having a conversation uh, with Solicitor General Tushar Mehta, where he said that, uh, look, uh, we, we, we need to dispense with ad hoc decision making. There needs to be a uniform policy architecture. Uh, there needs to be a stability. There needs to be a consistent, coherent policy. The guidelines need to be very uh, clearly communicated to all stakeholders uh, so that there is no ad hoc decision making. And it is, in fact, in continuation of that, that he said that uh, the ability to acknowledge that one is wrong is a sign of strength and not weakness, an indication, a nudge uh, coming from the Supreme Court there uh, to the government. Observation number two. Now, the third key observation, and this, of course, uh, is with respect to the Supreme Court expressing dissatisfaction. Uh, with the nature of information that is being supplied through affidavits. Now, normally, in the course of normal proceedings, parties furnish affidavits where they swear on oath and they give a true statement of facts and accounts, and that is how the Supreme Court learns of all the facts of the case. Here, the Supreme Court doesn't seem to be very satisfied. In fact, the Supreme Court uh, said, and I quote here, give us a policy document of Government of India, not simply an affidavit. We can't simply have an affidavit authorized by a joint secretary-level officer. Uh, what that effectively means is that uh, through this observation, Supreme Court uh, is expressing its dissatisfaction with the affidavits and the information uh, that is being supplied in the affidavits. And when the Supreme Court says a policy document that is, in fact, just a sophisticated reference to the file itself, the Supreme Court effectively is saying that we want to have a look at the file because the affidavit the government is submitting is not giving us a clear enough picture. So that, again, is a direct indictment of the submissions that have been made so far uh, in this case, uh, Justice Chandrachur is not very happy with that, saying that the files lying with the secretary-level officer, we need to see that, we need to see what the policy intent is, we need to see uh, the rationale uh, behind various policy maneuvers that have been taken. And as we'll explain uh, later in this link, there are a number of policy initiatives that the Supreme Court is not very happy with. Uh, we move on to observation number four now. Uh, and now, this is again, uh, we, were, we were speaking of uh, Supreme Court taking its exception to policy maneuvers. Here's one example. Uh, the Supreme Court, again, said, and I quote, the central government has wide powers uh, to fix rates under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act. We, why leave it uh, to the vaccine manufacturers uh, to have different pricing uh, for center and for states? Now, this is a direct, direct indictment 
of the policy for differential pricing. The Supreme Court is not happy uh, that the vaccine manufacturers uh, quote a certain rate to the center and quote almost uh, three times that rate uh, to the states. The Supreme Court taking exception to that, that this is simply not tenable. There is no rationale uh, to explain why one set of people should be uh, vaccinated at one certain cost, whereas uh, a different cost, a different price uh, should be extracted from the public, should be extracted from the exchequer uh, when it is being sold to the states or private hospitals. This differential pricing, uh, in fact, uh, led to very many questions as to why is the center not procuring these vaccines itself and then distributing it to the states at whatever value. So, again, very strong questions being raised on this policy maneuver here, allowing differential pricing. Uh, center, of course, making its position clear that, uh, look, we're buying it in bulk, so center gets it at a cheaper rate. Uh, but that rationale so far hasn't managed to break a cut in the ice uh, with the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, again, as this observation indicates, uh, being very stern on the matter, taking exception uh, to the issue. Uh, then we need to observation number five. Uh, now, this, again, uh, is a direct dig at the government in terms of its policy maneuvers. It will become clear once I read out the observation. Uh, and I quote here, Supreme Court says that in the 18 to 44 age group, there are 59 crore people in the country, uh, but under the government's formula, 50% of vaccines for the 18 to 44 year age group will be allocated to private hospitals, but will half of the 59 crores be able to afford uh, private hospitals? What the Supreme Court, unquote. Uh, Supreme Court essentially is saying that, look, under the policy that has been stated by the government as in its affidavit, what it says is that 25% of the vaccine that is produced by the two manufacturers uh, in the country will be allocated to private hospitals. Uh, now, the question being asked is that in the 18 to 44 age group, uh, there are 59 crore people. Uh, if that, uh, if in this age group, 59 uh, of the 59, if 25% is allocated to the private hospitals, will there really there be people in the 59 crores who can actually afford uh, to go to the private hospitals? So some uh, very sharp questions being asked. This again, uh, a question of pricing, a question of uh, vaccine procurement, vaccine distribution, the Supreme Court, again, uh, poking various holes in the story that has been forwarded so far uh, by the government. Uh, let's move ahead now, observation number six. And this is uh, with respect to the digital divide, people being asked to register uh, mandatorily on uh, the COVID app. Uh, here, the Supreme Court observes, and I quote here, agricultural laborers in Jharkhand are being expected to reg register on the COVID app. Uh, government keeps saying digital India, digital India, but government needs to have its ears on the ground. There is a clear digital divide. The center needs to wake up and smell the coffee again. Very, very sharp comments there. It gives an indication of uh, the level of dissatisfaction and frustration uh, in the apex court at some of these policies. The Supreme Court essentially uh, making it the observation there in context of the fact that uh, the Supreme Court noting that it is one thing to expect people in urban centers uh, to register on COVID app. There's a smartphone accessibility. Uh, there are good data speeds available. There's a good infrastructural setup available. Uh, but what about rural areas? What about agricultural laborers in backward states such as Jharkhand? Will they be able to even connect on the COVID application? Will they have the means to do so? If not, then will they be denied the benefit of vaccine and inoculation altogether? So these are, again, some very important questions being posed on the digital divide. And that was observation number six. And we'll move on to observation number seven. The reason for that is that it's quite similar. Uh, the point being driven home is quite similar. Uh, let's expand on that. So being quote said, and I quote here, that I'm the chairperson. This is uh, coming from Justice Chandra Chu. He said, and I quote, that I'm the chairperson of Supreme Court's e-committee. I know what the status of digital access is in rural areas. Center needs to recognize that there is not enough digital literacy. Center can't say that without COVID registration vaccines, will not be allowed. Now, this again, uh, building on that same point that, look, there is clearly a digital divide. People in rural areas clearly do not have uh, the same kind of digital access. To expect them uh, to get vaccines only once they register on COVID applications will, in fact, uh, be to their detriment. This They will be excluded from this entire exercise. And uh, as we go on and we'll expand later uh, as a part of this link, it will indicate what are the issues that, in fact, uh, the Supreme Court is highlighting. But clearly, as far as digital divide is concerned, Supreme Court taking exception to that, that this cannot be, in fact, an issue uh, where only once and only once a digital uh, signature is made or COVID legislation is made, uh, should inoculation be allowed. That is simply a discriminatory exercise, the Supreme Court hinting at that. That was observation number seven. Coming to observation number eight, and this is important here, the Supreme Court, Justice Chandra Chu in particular, uh, falling from him, uh, he said, and I quote, our arms are strong enough to come down on cases of non-compliance, unquote, 
Now, this, uh, allow me to paint the context here. He was having a conversation with Justice, uh, with, in fact, uh, Solicitor General Tushar Mehta, where he said that the whole, uh, the whole point of having this uh, uh, sue motor proceeding in the apex court is to provide a platform for various people to air their grievances and that those grievances can be taken across to the government or where the government can choose to act on it and that this is more of a dialogue uh, being encouraged here. But nonetheless, a small warning being slipped in there. Uh, so Justice Chandra to observing that our arms are strong enough to come down on cases of non-compliance. That's observation number eight. Observation number nine, this is... Uh, uh, in fact, a Supreme Court comment coming in on, again, the issue of uh, vaccine procurement. Here, the Supreme Court observes, again, this coming from Justice Chandrachul. He says, and I quote here, Article 1 says that India is, is the union of states. Uh, if we are a union of states, government of India needs to procure vaccines for the entire country. It can't be left to individual states and municipal corporations. They will be left in the lurch. Now, this is a direct, direct indictment, this comment coming in of the system of allowing states to, in fact, go and procure vaccines themselves. In fact, states like Punjab and Delhi have tried to procure vaccines, but they've been told and clarified by the likes of uh, Moderna and Pfizer that, look, we need only with the center, not with the states. And that is in, in response to that. And in fact, the Supreme Court made these observations here uh, that, look, uh, as, a, as far as the administrative structure is concerned, the center sits right at the top. The center is the one that is, in fact, heading the government of India, uh, and that with uh, they cannot be seen relinquishing their responsibility. They need to come forward. They need to take the charge to, in fact, procure the vaccines by themselves and then uh, do the needful as far as logistics and distribution are concerned uh, to, in fact, distribute those vaccines among the states. And that this policy of leaving the states in the lurch, leaving them to their own device, is not something tenable. And that's something that the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court will seek answers on as to why or what could be the possible policy rationale for allowing such a policy where the states and small unit territories are left in the lurch. In fact, the Supreme Court made an observation that, look, uh, larger municipal corporations like BMC have budgets which are larger than uh, the budgets of most states. Uh, but what about the smaller states? Will the people in those smaller states be left in the lurch? Will they be left uh, to their own devices? So again, an, an indictment of the vaccine procurement policy. And finally, uh, we now come to observation number 10 here. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, again, and I quote here, the Supreme Court's observation, uh, centers affidavit provides for 25% of vaccines uh, for private hospitals. There are no private hospitals in rural areas. Centers current policy seems to be exclusionary uh, to rural areas. Now, this again, a part of the vaccine distribution policy of the center. Now, as for the current policy, 25% of the vaccines that are produced in, in the country, locally, domestically, uh, are to be shipped, are allocated for shipping uh, to private uh, hospitals, which are not there in the rural area. So the question being asked here by the Apex Court is that, look, if 25% of all the doses manufactured are being shipped off to private hospitals, which are clearly not there in rural areas, what does that mean? Does that indicate perhaps an exclusionary approach uh, with respect to rural areas? So clearly, uh, some amount of dissatisfaction being conveyed there. Uh, all these issues being highlighted uh, for the benefit of the center. And importantly, the Supreme Court has given two weeks time for the center to go back to the drawing board, to come back and explain the policy inputs, the policy rationale, and perhaps the road forward. And two weeks later, again, let's keep in mind, the Supreme Court slipped in that warning that our arms are strong enough to come down on cases of non-compliance. So yes, uh, in context of these questions being posed, in context of that warning, two weeks hence, when the Supreme Court, when the government comes back uh, with its reply, that will be a critical date as that will give more clarity on the way forward and perhaps will indicate whether or not the Supreme Court will accept it, or whether the Supreme Court chooses to, in fact, uh, use stronger tactics and use a stronger approach against the center. We don't find that out once the center files its uh, uh, affidavit. But clearly, the Supreme Court looking to turn on the heat, looking to tighten the screws and seeking some solid, concrete answers from the center.